Welcome to the Choral Connection, a series of interviews with musicians with whom Maestro Harold Rosenbaum has collaborated over his 47-year international conducting career. We hope you are inspired by their artistry and the stories they have to tell. For more about the series, please visit www.haroldrosenbaum.com. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have the honor of speaking to one of the most renowned composers in the world, Osvaldo Golihov. And first, let me tell you about him. He was born in Argentina in a Jewish family that emigrated from Romania. In 1983, he immigrated to Israel, where he studied at the Rubin Academy of Music in Jerusalem. Three years later, he studied with George Crum at the University of Pennsylvania where he earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree. In 1991, Golihov joined the faculty of the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. During the 2012-2013 concert season, he occupied the Richard and Barbara Debs Composers Chair at Carnegie Hall. Dr. Golihov grew up listening to chamber music, Jewish liturgical and klezma music, and Nuevo Tango, which is an evolution of tango dance that developed in the 1980s. In 2000, he produced his defining hit, La Passion Según San Marcos, or uh, The Passion of St. Mark, a celebration of Latin American folk music laced with Gregorian chant and Afro-Caribbean drumming. The critic, Mark Swed, recalled the 25 minute ovation that followed the premiere in Stuttgart, Germany, and his feeling that modern music history had just been made. He continued to say with La Passion, Mr. Golihov became the evangelist of a new musical syncretism, a blending of the old and new worlds that seemed to offer a way out of the sectarianism and musty habits of the classical industry. Starting in 2000, he composed movie soundtracks for documentaries and other films, including The Man Who Cried, Youth Without Youth, and Tetro and Twixt. His later work, a song cycle called Falling Out of Time, was inspired by a novel by Israeli author David Grossman. Of course, you can read more about him on his website. You just Google his name. Um, so first, since I mentioned, uh, Osvaldo, the film scores, I do want to tell that fu rather funny story Yeah. about <laughs> that uh, I received a phone call from you in, I don't know, 2006 or so after we already collaborated. I'll tell you uh, folks out there about this collaboration in a minute. And you told me you were writing a another film score, to correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, for um, Francis Ford Coppola, the director, for a film he was producing. Yeah. And perhaps would I be interested in supplying the, you know, the, the soundtrack uh, with my professional choir, the New York Virtuoso Singers. And uh, I thought for about a hundredth of a second and said, yes. <laughs> and uh, he said, great, I'll put you in touch with uh, Goliath's, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, you know, manager or assistant who did call me. And uh, it would be of course, music written by you and, and we would rehearse and record it. And uh, in the conversation, she asked me for an approximate budget for, you know, I knew your style of writing and I, so I could estimate what the budget would be based on the number of hours I thought uh, it would be because she told me the length of, of music. And I gave her a budget. It wasn't that much. It was, I believe, seven, eight or nine thousand dollars. I told her it would be. And then she said, well, uh, Mr. Coppola, who owns a vineyard in California, would like to pay your singers in wine. And I declined. I said, singers really have to get money, not wine. So it never happened. So <laughs> I was sad to, uh, for that conclusion, but it is kind of funny in retrospect. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Well, I, I take the wine, but of course I had other sources of income. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my poor singers, you know, I, I'm always looking yeah. at 
Um, that's good. That's that's yeah. It's, he's a wonderful, funny guy, and 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 actually, like why? I mean, he he wouldn't be paying with the Trader Joe's wines that he sells. He, I mean, the the good wines are amazing. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I yeah. know good things about it, but uh, my singers do have to pay their rent. So I. We oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know it wasn't it wasn't uh, anything you had control over, but it is funny to think about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now I will tell the audience how we first met. Um, we collaborated on a concert performance uh, of your first opera, Aina Dama, mm -hmm. at Carnegie Hall, conducted by Bob Spano. Right. Soon after its world premiere at Tanglewood, and Dawn Opshaw played one of the lead characters for our performance. And I trained the women of my New York virtuoso singers. It just called for a women's chorus, so I expanded the size. I think we had maybe 24 singers. Yeah, yeah. And for that wonderful concert, I remember that the sound you wanted from them was one that I have never tried to elicit from them before or after that. Can you explain what role they played and what- Yeah, they played many, many roles, but I think you are referring to when they are supposed to be like girls in the streets of Granada, just singing casually a, a, a ballad, right? A, that That is a popular song. I, I wrote it, but- it, I wanted that sound uh, very um, untrained, but powerful. Mm. And uh, the, I remember you uh, tweaking it. I mean, you were talking to them and, and uh, what kind of things did you tell these very trained voices to do? Are, uh, uh, I think mostly to, to glide, right? Like, I think that the tune is like, I quería tan triste en Granada que a las piedras like I think that that classical singer sometimes not only is a, a thing of sound but it's a thing of verticality like like they tend to be if you write the rhythm I quería tan triste en Granada they they do them but I wanted to do it you know like more like a river, I don't know, like, like people yeah. singing the street collectively. That makes mm -hmm. sense. And I know that you, uh, as I've said, or, or will say later that you, you use, uh, you know, Gregorian chant type of singing in, in your operas and your, your works. And of course, yeah, yeah. Oh, bar lines, bar lines there, but yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it is a, an interesting thing. It's not just, again, it's not just the sound uh, that is different, not always, right? I mean, sometimes it's just, I, I love classical sound too. Uh, but I think that the sound is very, very important, but also the kind of phrasing it, to be idiomatic too, because other, because the voice, you know, we know it, it's the instrument that can, that cannot lie. <laughs> so if you sing exactly the notes and the rhythms, but with a different idiom uh, or or a, or a different sound, then there is something that that is does not connect with the right. Listener. And they have to let go of their training for a while and just sound. Yeah, better. yeah. I think it's a good. I mean, I myself try to let go of the training many times because I think it's good. It's healthy to to forget and for a creator especially. But I think ultimately for performance could also be a good exercise. Miles Davis <laughs> many times would ask his players, just, just play as if you have never touched the instrument. I mean, like for the first time, you know, I, I, it's just like never lose that innocence. So anyways, good. we could talk about, a lot about this. <laughs> it, it reminds me a little bit of like Schubert's Earl Koenig, the Earl King, when the singer has to portray four voices Right, the father, the son, the Earl King, and the mm -hmm. narrator, and have different amazing, yeah. yeah. Um, just as an aside, at the Rubin Academy, did you meet or study with the composer Menachem Zur? You know? I met him, of course. I, I mean, I didn't study with him, but but he, but I, I, I spoke with him many, many times. He was a great character. Where is is he in Israel or in, in here? Because he spent time here, right? I met him when I was a, uh, a graduate student or just after graduate school at Queens College in, in okay. New York. He was a, an adjunct. I, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure he was an adjunct. Um, yeah, he was teaching here. And in fact, one summer, no, for about 10 summers, I was in charge of the uh, summer session and I hired him to teach two courses, a couple of courses. 
Um, but that's before he moved. Uh, yeah, no, I love that guy. I, I, actually, when I was in the academy, I remember that at least one year he was here, and that's why I didn't study with him. But yeah. So you you then studied with composer George Crum at the University of Pennsylvania, where you earned your Doctor of Philosophy degree. So that confuses me. Um, I'm being a no, little. Yeah. I mean, PhD in music, right? Not not philosophy. No, I'm not the philosopher. I don't know why it's no, just a PhD in music. Yeah. That up because on I read somewhere online, which you always can't always count on. I because yeah. I, I, I was going to ask you, it confuses me. I was going to say, did students of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates earn that or doctor of music degrees? But forget that. That it doesn't apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's very funny. That's very, very funny. Yeah. 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 Okay. The next question, do you think young composers have more experience with non-classical music than when we were young? And if so, does this show in their compositions? I, I would, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if they have more experience, but they are definitely more uh, unprejudiced, unprejudiced to use it because when we were students, it was a pretty tough time of great uh, restrictions and like, you know, I, I, um, I think we all loved other musics, but it was closet love, right? I, I even, I tell you one thing in my upbringing, I was a student in Tanglewood and the person the, that made a humongous difference in my life and he barely knows, I mean, I told him later, uh, is uh, Bill Balcom, the wonderful composer, right? He came as a guest, uh, as a teacher for just one lecture. So we introduced each other and, and I said, I'm Osvaldo from Argentina. And he could have easily said, oh, the land of Alberto Ginastera. But he said, oh, it's the land of Astor Piazzolla, who I adored every day. I would play his music. And, but of course, it was like, oh, no, this, this is only for me at home, <laughs> you know? And he's like gave me, he, the, the way he said Piazzolla with such love and admiration, it was, it was a huge uh, impulse to just, I mean, I, I think I, I was able to reconcile those two halves of myself. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that it's necessary today for young students to experience the permission by an older a composer or musician, but they are, they, I think that in general, I see that there is a great freedom and, and I think that that is good actually. It's very good. Yeah, a lot of more variety these days than there was 50 years ago when or how many, you know, 60 years ago when if you didn't write serial music, you weren't hired by universities. Oh yeah. And even even if you were at the university, then you were like I think George Cram was is an amazing composer and he never did serial music. And and, and he had, I think, success with audiences and 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 he connected, but I think he was a little bit even Bernstein too. I mean it, it was it was really difficult. I mean, you have a giant like Leonard Burns and having to, to make excuses for his music. That's crazy. No, and people like Ned Roram never made excuses. And now, you know, his, you know, and so many composers, their music is in fashion where they were struggling. Right. right. I, mean, I think that we all, I think that societies, I mean, and I guess <laughs> these, these years are an example. Societies go through periods of madness, of like, of, of, of dogmas or like, and then you say, why? I mean, like you look back and, and, and you say, of course the Beatles are amazing. And of course all, all kinds of popular music are incredible. And all those people who wasted their lives. I mean, I'm not saying serial music is not great. I mean, there are some great serial composers and there are a lot of serial composers that are not good. I'm not saying in every style, right? But why should the one style be above the other? That's what I, I'm trying to say. And you mentioned Bill Balcom, his music is like very, quite varied in style. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then you have people like Bill Schumann, William Schumann and, and, you know, Milton Babbitt. I mean, so many composers dabbled in pop music and jazz. John yeah. Harbour plays jazz, it's amazing. Um, 
<laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, in many of your compositions, you make use of indigenous instruments, that mm -hmm. is, those uh, unique to a particular society or culture, in addition to standard Western instruments. Do you find that first class players from around the world whose primary instruments are those found in the traditional Western orchestra are also involved more and more with indigenous instruments or do you have to seek out those players elsewhere? And if so, where, how do you go about doing that? Right, right. Um, that's a very good question. You know, it's a risk, but again, it, that comes from Piazzolla, right? Who decided to write all his music with the bandoneon, right? With the, the, the Argentinian accordion, which is actually German. And, and, and he took a risk. And now, at the, time that, at the time that he was doing his music, only Argentinian people played the bandoneon. But so many musicians all around the world became enamored of that music because it is there is such truth. And it, they are that you have amazing bandoneon players in Japan, in Norway, in Finland, in Germany, in France, England, everywhere now. So, so um, it's not a matter of just using them just because those instruments. But but when something has to be said by a particular instrument, then do it. Right. I mean, at, at the same time, it's very beautiful sometimes. To not use it and to create the illusion of that instrument, right? Um, but I, I, I think that we live in a world that we cannot be constricted, right? I mean, like, look, the symphony orchestra also was not born like this. One day didn't have clarinets, then Mozart brought in the clarinet with Haydn. The, the clarinet was pretty modern, right? right. And then other, so yeah, music is music. Music has to. Yeah. yeah, embrace. Embrace, I was just gonna say the same word. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, a friend of mine, Bruce Weinberger, who was one of the original members of the Rauscher Saxophone Quartet. Right, yeah. Um, his teacher, Sigurd Rauscher, was a clarinetist, or the principal clarinetist, I think was a Philadelphia orchestra, but he was the greatest um, saxophone player in the world. And he's uh, Alban Berg. Uh, the saxophone in Lulu, and that's because of Sigurd Rausch. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Yeah. Just one more question, and then I want to devote the rest of the discussion to your latest work. So what led you to emigrate from Argentina to Israel instead of going to America, which you did eventually? Was it a certain teacher you wished to study with there? Um, I think... Probably if I had, I mean, I didn't have money to come to America. <laughs> so, but also for me, the, it was important to feel as a first class citizen somewhere. <laughs> I always felt in Argentina a little bit, uh, oh. a bit no, I wouldn't say scared, but yeah, it was not the same to be Jewish than to be not Jewish. And, and it was, uh, I felt I was, not completely myself, not completely free to be who I wanted to be. So for me, it was important to, to experience mm -hmm. that. And then, and then as Israel, I, lo I love Israel and I have family, I have even a daughter now there. As I think that when I finished the academy, I felt that I wanted, I still had so much to grow. And, and I felt that it would be good to come here. And, but, but the idea at that point was to go back, but then you know how life is, change yeah. and this. It's yeah. ironic, it's ironic that in New York City, there are more Jews than in Israel. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, I want to devote the rest of this discussion to your latest work, Falling Out of Time. And before this interview, I, I told, um, I asked Osvaldo if, uh, and he wouldn't mind me just talking about it for five or six minutes before I ask you a question. And I assure you and the folks listening that the content of part of this discussion will be nothing you or anyone listening will expect. I only learned about this piece falling out of time when I started doing research after Osvaldo kindly consented to do this interview. In 2011, the Israeli novelist David Grossman published Falling Out of Time a haunting fable about a grief-stricken father who sets out on a journey to connect with his dead child. 
Five years earlier, Mr. Grossman's son had been killed during his country's war with Lebanon. Falling Out of Time dealt with tragedy, survival, and the mystery of existence. Once published, the book found its way into your hands. And when you discovered Mr. Grossman's uh, book, you said, I had been looking for the perfect story to ask all these questions, mm -hmm. uh, questions of you know, trauma and loss and things like that. Uh, you created a song cycle about bereavement and isolation. Diverse styles, including the tango, klezmer, pop, and sapphoric ballads are woven together with skillful orchestration that can turn swiftly from luscious to tart. Vocalists from outside the Western classical tradition add emotional urgency. Harrowing and hallucinogenic, this song cycle has unintended resonance in a year that has familiarized so many with trauma and loss. Had it not been for the coronavirus, this work would already have been presented at Tanglewood and Carnegie Hall. I'm reading from notes I've read before I put my own two cents in. Um, Mr. Grossman's text imagines a bereaved father walking in ever widening circles driven by questions addressed to his dead son. Where are you? What are you? And who are you there? He attracts a disparate group of fellow travelers, all driven by private griefs. Though answers have eluded him, he has carved out the space to breathe inside the pain. Okay, I saw two long ex excerpts from Falling Out of Time in a live interview and performance on YouTube. Mm -hmm. it was a, a, a Robin Young. Wood? Robin Young. Robin Young. Uh, TV, oh, it was a TV station, I believe. In the, yeah, in the National Public Radio Station here in, in Boston, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it was an interview and live performance. Um, it was indeed very powerful and for me painful because I lost my 11-year-old son, Joshua, 17 years ago while I was in Europe mm -hmm. in a freak accident on Long Island and I will never fully heal from the experience. It took me a year and a half to carve out the space to breathe inside the pain. That happened when I awakened one day and heard a bird singing for the first time since his death, and I realized that I would survive my loss. Many of the questions asked by the anguished father in your piece hit home. Where are you? What are you? And who are you there? After my own son's death, I would look up and search the skies, wondering where he was and what he was doing. The mother in the book said she knew when the messenger of death would come. My son knew he would die very soon, but logically he couldn't have because it was a freak accident at a beach on July 9th, 1983. But the messenger obviously came to Joshua because he wrote me a letter while I was abroad, which he never sent, expressing great fear about his looming death. And logically, I should not have cried uncontrollably until I was the last one out of the huge concert hall in London on July 10th, the day after, after seeing a long, broad, resplendent ray of light within which a soul was rising all the way up from the floor to the ceiling during the fifth movement of the Brahms Requiem, where the soprano soloist, the voice of an angel, tenderly tells us not to grieve for our lost one because one day we will reunite in paradise. And logically, two different people should not have seen an identical celestial vision right after his death, which contained a man with a beard grasping Joshua and pointing upwards, a vision which disappeared from both people who saw this with the blink of an eye. A few months earlier, I had chosen to conduct the Brahms Requiem in the fall. I did not renege on the challenge. And with the help of gorgeous and inspirational music and the love and support from the entire cast of performers in the orchestra and chorus somehow made it through the most difficult concert I ever conducted. It was not cathartic, it was extraordinarily painful, but I just felt I had to face it. Brahms wrote his requiem after he lost his mother to give solace and to comfort the living. Mahler did it in his Kinter Totenlieder, meaning songs on the death of children, with words by Friedrich Rückert, who lost his two children to scarlet fever. The poems are singular, almost manic documents of the psychological endeavor to cope with such loss. 
they attempt a poetic resuscitation of the children that is punctuated by anguished outbursts. But above all, the poems show a quiet acquiescence to fate and to a peaceful world of solace. Mahler's settings reflect a mixture of feelings, anguish, fantasy, resuscitation of the children, and resignation. The final song ends in a major key and a mood of transcendence. Musically, then, this is the last word of the Kinder leader that death is powerful, yet love is even stronger. But back in the Renaissance, both Wilkes and Tompkins simply laid out bare stories of loss of children in their profoundly tormented works entitled When David Heard, as did Just Can de Pre and Heinrich Schutz in their works entitled Absalom Fili Me. I still struggle to find the courage and resolve to listen to these works and many others which hit me hard and still cause me deep pain. In all the above examples, people sang in the style of the time and in the traditional way, but in your music, but back to your music, in rendering the anguish of the bereaved, the singers push their voices to extremes, including wordless groans and cries that blend eerily with the sounds of certain instruments. So realistic, so painful. The intensity is unexpected with unfiltered raw grief, merciless aching and howling from the depths of the heart. Hearing your work, I felt I was in the midst of a tormented meditation. The protagonist and listeners are allowed to escape into a safe place, which is regularly disrupted by recurring stabs of grief. It is not for the faint hearted, and yet it is an honest and personal story that must be told. I believe you have said that you had to write Falling Out of Time because it was a discovery of a lifelong search. It is ironic that those who get all these pieces the most, these pieces that I mentioned, are the ones who go beyond experiencing masterpieces, they go beyond deeply being deeply moved by the message and they go to a place that conjures unending and ultimate pain, torture and despair. But isn't art supposed to engage and move its audience? Shouldn't they leave uplifted, educated or even shaken up? Sure. But in certain circumstances, shouldn't one be warned in advance what sort of experience to expect so that a decision could be made to avoid it or to confront it, embrace it, like on CNN or YouTube when they say that viewer discretion is advised about the video they're about to display or the, this movie contains graphic images, you know, dot, dot, dot. Even then, the intensity of the experience, the long mental end, spiritual blitz in your piece could easily conjure up the profound grief, which might be quite unwelcome yet again. For many years after losing my son, I plunged into despair at the mere sight of any father and son walking together. A bereaved friend told you that he spent 20 years building wars and your piece just erased them. I am truly glad for him, but fearful for others who might not be in a place of acceptance and a state of transcendence as was Mahler finally. But regarding a composer's needs and desires, thank God for your voice, your fervor, your vision and your ability and that of other fabulous composers to influence and transport listeners and to transform society. Thank God for composers like you who force us to contemplate, to reassess and to feel. So that's my story. It's a very powerful piece, as you know, and uh, I thank you for it. So, um, yeah. you know, Harold, I I cannot even uh, pretend for a second to understand what you live, what you have lived, and what you live, and the same for David Grossman, right? I mean, I cannot. Uh, even after working on that piece for three years, I, I don't I, I cannot say that I learned one thing. I mean, I, I know that whatever I learned is completely useless. So then if the question is legitimate, why? Why write it? And, and I think, first of all, is a kind of loss that we know has no name, right? I mean, has no name. you're not a, a widower, you're not an orphan, you are a bereaved father, which is 
you need two words. It's almost like language itself cannot fathom, right? That, that loss. And then I think that the, the most understandable uh, uh, reaction to that, from, not from the bereaved, but from the friends, the family, is, is to avoid, to avert your gaze. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I knew, before I knew David, I knew, I knew six other couples of friends who have lost children. And, and it's hard to even, I, it's hard to be around, you don't know, you avert your gaze. And I said, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want the peace to be like saying, I am with you, I'm accompanying you with full knowledge that there is a limit to the to where I can accompany or where the music can and there is a moment where the grief is is a state of exile right and and the, the bereaved will be in that exile and David said even a father and a mother who love their son with the same exact intensity grieved him grieved him in their separate islands and that's why the mother in the piece cannot go with the father right. on that walk. Right. She, it, it, so it is, it is such a cruel kind of grief because, anyways, but, but the idea was, okay, let's not avert the gaze and let's accompany up to that, knowing the limits of, right. you know, that's all. <laughs> Let me tell you why that's so meaningful to me because I experienced it. Um, it was so important to hear that in your story because what comforted me most was friends who didn't avert their eyes. Mm -hmm. People just coming and being with me, standing beside me, just like in your story. Yeah. That was the most comforting thing because and going to, you know, going to therapy didn't really help. Yeah. Time, time heals, but, um, but people can heal too. And, and music can heal too, <laughs> obviously. But it, you put it all together, and uh, it's the support system that's really important. Just receiving in those days before computers, you know, I got countless number of sympathy cards. They were so healing. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for em embracing that subject matter and creating another masterpiece, Osvaldo. <laughs> you are really something. <laughs> You're a great composer and a great man. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I mean, that's what uh, I don't have. I don't know if it's a masterpiece, but I work very, very seriously and, and hard on it. Yes. All right. Well, if there's uh, anything else to add, please, please feel free or else I'll let you go. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I think this is too, uh, for me, to hear all this, which I did not know, Harvey, is, yeah. is well, wow. I, I can, I, I, I mean, if you have a question, I'll answer, but otherwise I think I'm not. Well, I'm, I hope, uh, hope I didn't upset you with the, this. No, 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 how can, no, I mean, you, again, you are the one that is, Healing. carries that for the rest of your life, and, and no, it's, but it's powerful to hear this. It's very, yeah. Here's well, one, more, one more thing. Um, my, my wife and I went to a, an acquaintance of hers house. She wasn't a friend. She was a fellow teacher in mm -hmm. the school. And this friend, I forget her name, which was many years ago, um, told us she had a, a psychic friend coming up from down south. You want to, he wants, you want to do a reading with him. Okay. So we went paid off $50 or whatever it was. And he doesn't take two people at a time, but his, his uh, sidekick or assistant came out and said, well, you had a loss together, so I'll see you. We didn't know her, we didn't know him. He knew everything, okay? <laughs> but after we left, I mean, he knew everything. After we left, we were called back in the room because this man said, I, he has something else to tell you. And we went back in and he simply said, Joshua is painting. Now, all over my house, I can take, move the camera. I can show you, he painted. We have framed paintings and he's still painting. Okay. <laughs> so I 
I believe right from the beginning, I believed I, I'll see him again in paradise. And that's what got me through it, by the way. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Thank mm -hmm. you, Harold. Thank you. Um, the, I hope we'll make music again one day. The next film for <laughs> next film with money, not with wine. <laughs> Take care. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Come